Chapter Eight: The Wind Giants. High in the air rode Atreyu, his red cloak flowing behind him. His blue-black hair fluttered in the wind. With steady, wave-like movements, Falkor, the white luck dragon, glided through the mists and tatters of clouds. Up and down, and up and down, and up and down. How long had they been flying? For days and nights and more days, Atreyu had lost track. The dragon had the gift of flying in his sleep. Further and further they flew. Sometimes Atreyu dozed off, clinging fast to the dragon's white mane. But it was only a light, restless sleep, and more and more his waking became a dream, all hazy and blurred. Shadowy mountains passed below him, lands and seas, islands and rivers. Atreyu had lost interest in them and gave up trying to hurry Falkor as he had done on first leaving the Southern Oracle. For then he had been impatient, thinking it a simple matter for one with a dragon to ride to reach the border of Fantasia and cross it to the outer world. He hadn't known how very large Fantasia was. Now he had to fight the leaden weariness that was trying to overpower him. His eyes, once as keen as a young eagle's, had lost their distant vision. From time to time, he would pull himself upright and try to look around, but then he would sink back and stare straight ahead at the dragon's long, supple body with its pearly pink and white scales. Falkor was tired too. His strength, which had seemed inexhaustible, was running out. More than once. In the course of their long flight, they had seen below them spots which the nothing had invaded, and which gave them the feeling that they were going blind. Seen from that height, many of these spots seemed relatively small, but others were as big as whole countries. Fear gripped the luck dragon and his rider, and at first they changed direction to avoid looking at the horror. But strange as it may seem, horror loses its power to frighten when repeated too often. And since the patches of nothing became more and more frequent, the travelers were gradually getting used to them. They had been flying in silence for quite some time when suddenly Falkor's bronze bell tone rang out, "Atreyu, my little master, are you asleep?" "No," said Atreyu. Though actually he had been caught up in a terrifying dream. "What is it, Falkor?" I've been wondering if it wouldn't be wiser to turn back. Turn back? Where to? To the ivory tower, to the childlike empress. You want us to go to her empty-handed? I wouldn't call it that, Atreyu. What was your mission? To discover the cause of her illness and find out what would cure it. But said Falkor, nothing was said about your bringing her the cure. What do you mean? Maybe it's a mistake trying to cross the border of Fantasia in search of a human. I don't see what you're driving at, Falkor. Explain yourself. The childlike empress is deathly sick," said the dragon, "because she needs a new name. Morla, the aged one, told you that, but only a human, only a child of man from the outer world, can give her this name. Ulala told you that." So you've actually completed your mission. It seems to me you should let the childlike empress know it as soon as possible. But it won't do her a bit of good," Atreyu protested. "Unless I bring her the human who can save her." "Don't be so sure," said Falkor. "She has much greater power than you or I. Maybe she would have no difficulty in bringing a human to Fantasia." Maybe she has ways that are unknown to you and me and everyone else in Fantasia, but to do so, she needs to know what you have found out. If that's the way it is, there's no point in our trying to find a human on our own. She might even die while we're looking. But maybe if we turn back in time, we can save her. Atreyu made no answer. The dragon could be right, he reflected, but then he could be wrong. If he went back now with his message, the childlike empress might very well say, "What good does that do me? And now it's too late to send you out again." He didn't know what to do, 
and he was tired, much too tired to decide anything. You know, Falcor, he said hardly above a whisper, you may be right, or you may be wrong. Let's fly on a little further. Then if we haven't come to a border, we'll turn back. What do you mean by a little further? the dragon asked. A few hours, Atreyu murmured. Oh, well, just one hour. All right, said Falcor, just one hour. But that one hour was one hour too many. They hadn't noticed that the sky in the north was black with clouds. In the west, the sky was aflame and ugly-looking clouds hung down over the horizon like seaweed. In the east, a storm was rising like a blanket of gray lead, and all around it there were tatters of cloud that looked like blue ink blots. And from the south came a sulfur-yellow mist streaked with lightning. We seem to be getting into bad weather, said Falcor. Atreyu looked in all directions. Yes, he said. It looks bad, but what can we do but fly on? It would be more sensible, said Falcor, to look for shelter. If this is what I think, it's no joke. What do you think? Atreyu asked. I think it's the four wind giants starting one of their battles. They're almost always fighting to see which is the strongest and should rule over the others. To them, it's a sort of game because they have nothing to fear. But God help anyone who gets caught in their little tiffs. Can't you fly higher? Atreyu asked. Beyond their reach, you mean? No, I can't fly that high, and as far as I can see, there's nothing but water below us. Some enormous ocean. I don't see any place to hide in. Then, said Atreyu, we'll just have to wait till they get here. Anyway, there's something I want to ask them. What? cried the dragon, so terrified that he jumped in a manner of speaking sky high. If they are the four wind giants, Atreyu explained, they must know all four corners of Fantasia. If anyone can tell us where the borders are, it's them. Good Lord, cried the dragon. You think you can just stop and chat with wind giants? What are their names? Atreyu asked. The one from the north, said Falcor, is called Lear. The one from the east is Boreo, the one from the south is Shirek, and the one from the west is Maestril. But tell me, Atreyu, what are you? Are you a little boy or a bar of iron? How come you're not afraid? When I passed through the Sphinx's gate, Atreyu replied, I lost all my fear. And besides, I'm wearing the emblem of the childlike empress. Everyone in Fantasia respects it. Why shouldn't the wind giants... Oh, they will, cried Falcor. They will, but they're stupid and nothing can make them stop fighting one another. You'll see. Meanwhile, the storm clouds from all four directions had converged. It seemed to Atreyu that he was at the center of a huge funnel, which was revolving faster and faster, mixing the silver yellow, the leaden gray, the blood red, and the deep black all together. He and his white dragon were spun about in a circle like a matchstick in a great whirlpool. And then he saw the wind giants. Actually, all he saw was faces because their limbs kept changing in every possible way, from long to short, from clear-cut to misty, and they were so knotted together in a monstrous free-for-all that it was impossible to make out their real shapes or even how many of them there were. The faces, too, were constantly changing, now they were round and puffed, now stretched from top to bottom or from side to side. But at all times, they could be told apart. They opened their mouths and bellowed and roared and howled and laughed at one another. They didn't even seem to notice the dragon and his rider, who were gnats in comparison to the wind giants. Atreyu raised himself as high as he could, with his right hand, he reached for the golden amulet on his chest and shouted at the top of his lungs, In the name of the childlike empress, be still and listen. And the unbelievable happened. As though suddenly stricken dumb, 
they fell silent. Their mouths closed, and eight gigantic goggle eyes were directed at Orin. The tempest stopped, and the air was deathly still. Answer me, cried Atreyu. Where are the borders of Fantasia? Do you know Lear? Oh, do you know Lear? Not in the north, said the black cloud face. And you, Boreo? Not in the east, said the leaden gray cloud face. You tell me, Shirek. There is no border in the south, said the sulfur yellow cloud face. Maestril, do you know? No border in the west, said the fiery red cloud face. And then they all spoke as with one mouth. Who are you who bear the emblem of the childlike empress and don't know that Fantasia has no borders? Atreyu made no reply. He was stunned. It had never occurred to him that Fantasia might have no borders whatsoever. Then his whole quest had been for nothing. He hardly noticed it when the wind giants resumed their war game. He had given up caring what would happen to him. He clung fast to the dragon's mane when they were hurled upward by a whirlwind. The lightning played around them. They were spun in a circle and almost drowned in a downpour of rain. They were sucked into a fiery wind that nearly burned them up. But a moment later, a hailstorm, consisting not of stones but of icicles as long as spears, flung them downward. So it went, up and down, down and up, this way and that. The wind giants were fighting for power. A gust of wind turned Falcor over on his back. Hold tight, he shouted, but it was too late. Atreyu had lost his hold and fell. He fell and fell, and then he lost consciousness. When he came to, Atreyu was lying on white sand. He heard the sound of waves, and when he looked around, he saw that he had been washed up on a beach. It was a gray, foggy day, but there was no wind. The sea was calm, and there was no sign that the wind giants had been fighting a battle only a short time before. The beach was flat, and there were no hills or rocks in sight, only a few gnarled and crooked trees which, seen through the mist, looked like great clawed hands. Atreyu sat up. Seeing his red buffalo hair cloak a few steps away, he crawled over to it and threw it over his shoulders. To his surprise, it was almost dry, so he must have been lying there for quite a while. How had he got there? Why hadn't he drowned? Dimly, he remembered arms that had carried him and strange singing voices. Poor child, beautiful child, hold him, don't let him go under. Perhaps it had only been the sound of the waves. Or could it have been sea nymphs and water sprites? Probably they had seen the glory and that was why they had saved him. Involuntarily, he reached for the amulet. It was gone. There was no chain around his neck. He had lost the gem. Falcor! He shouted as loud as he could. He jumped up and ran back and forth, shouting in all directions, Falcor! Falcor! Where are you? No answer came. Only the slow, steady sound of the waves breaking against the beach. Heaven only knew where the wind giants had driven the white dragon. Maybe Falcor was looking for his little master in an entirely different place, miles and miles away. Maybe he wasn't even alive. No longer was Atreyu a dragon rider, and no longer was he the childlike empress's messenger. He was only a little boy, and all alone. The clock in the belfry struck six. By then, it was dark outside. The rain had stopped. Not a sound to be heard. Bastion stared into the candle flames. Then he gave a start. The floor had creaked. He thought he heard someone breathing. He held his breath and listened. Except for the small circle of light shed by the candles, it was dark in the big attic. Didn't he hear soft steps on the stairs? Hadn't the handle of the attic door moved ever so slowly? 
Again, the floor creaked. What if there were ghosts in this attic? Nonsense, said Bastion none too loudly. There's no such thing. Everyone knows that. Then why were there so many stories about them? Maybe all the people who say ghosts don't exist are just afraid to admit that they do. Atreyu wrapped himself up tight in his red cloak for he was cold and started inland. The country, as far as he could see through the fog, was flat and monotonous. The only change he noticed as he strode along was the appearance among the stunted trees of bushes which looked as if they were made of rusty sheet metal and were almost as hard. You could easily hurt yourself brushing against them if you weren't careful. About an hour later, Atreyu came to a road paved with bumpy, irregularly shaped stones. Thinking it was bound to lead somewhere, he decided to follow it, but preferred to walk on the soft ground beside the bumpy paving stones. The road kept twisting and turning, though it was hard to see why, for there was no sign of any hill, pond, or stream. In that part of the country, everything seemed to be crooked. Atreyu hadn't been skirting the road for very long when he heard a strange thumping sound. It was far away, but coming closer. It sounded like the muffled beat of a big drum. In between beats, he heard a tinkling of bells and a shrill piping that could have been made by fifes. He hid behind a bush by the side of the road and waited to see what would happen. Slowly, the strange music came closer, and then the first shapes emerged from the fog. They seemed to be dancing, but it was a dance without charm or gaiety. The dancers jumped grotesquely, rolled on the ground, crawled on all fours, leapt into the air, and carried on like crazy people. But all Atreyu could hear was the slow, muffled drum beats, the shrill fifes, and a whimpering and panting from many throats. More and more figures appeared. The procession seemed endless. Atreyu looked at the dancers' faces. They were ashen gray and bathed in sweat, and the eyes had a wild, feverish glow. Some of the dancers lashed themselves with whips. They're mad! Atreyu thought, and a cold shiver ran down his spine. The procession consisted mostly of night hops, kobolds, and ghosts. There were vampires as well, and quite a few witches, old ones with great humps and beards, but also young ones who looked beautiful and wicked. If he had had Orin, he would have approached them and asked what was going on, as it was, he preferred to stay in his hiding place until the mad procession had passed and the last straggler vanished, hopping and limping in the fog. Only then did he venture out on the road and look after the ghostly procession. Should he follow them? He couldn't make up his mind. By that time, to tell the truth, he didn't know if there was anything that he should or should not do. For the first time, he was fully aware of how much he needed the childlike Empress's amulet and how helpless he was without it. And not only or even mainly because of the protection it had given him, it was thanks to his own strength, after all, that he had stood up to all the hardships and terrors and the loneliness of his quest. But as long as he had carried the emblem, he had never been at a loss for what to do. Like a mysterious compass, it had guided his thoughts in the right direction. And now that was changed. Now he had no secret power to lead him. He had no idea what to do, he, but he couldn't bear to stand there as though paralyzed. So he made himself follow the muffled drumming, which could still be heard in the distance. While making his way through the fog, always careful to keep a suitable distance between himself and the last stragglers, he tried to put his thoughts in order. Why, oh why, hadn't he listened when Falcor advised him to fly straight to the childlike empress? He would have brought her Eulala's message and returned the gem. Without Orin and without Falcor, he would never be able to reach her. She would wait for him till her last moment, hoping he would come, trusting him to save her in Fantasia, but in vain. That in itself was bad enough, but still worse was what he had learned from the wind giants, 
that Fantasia had no borders. If there was no way of leaving Fantasia, then it would be impossible to call in a human form across the border. Because Fantasia was endless, its end was inevitable. But while he was stumbling over the bumpy paving stones in the fog, Eulala's gentle voice resounded in his memory and a spark of hope was kindled in his heart. Lots of humans had come to Fantasia in the past and given the childlike empress glorious new names. That's what she had sung. So there was a way from the one world to the other. For them it is near, but for us too far. Never can we go out to them. Yes, those were Eulala's words. Humans, the children of man, had forgotten the way. But mightn't just one of them, a single one, remember? His own hopeless situation mattered little to Atreyu. What mattered was that a human should hear Fantasia's cry of distress and come to the rescue as had happened many times before. Perhaps, perhaps one had already started out and was on his way. Yes, yes, Bastion shouted. Then, terrified of his own voice, he added more softly, I'd go and help you if I knew how. I don't know the way, Atreyu. I honestly don't. The muffled drum beats and the shrill piping had stopped. Without noticing it, Atreyu had come so close to the procession that he almost ran into the last stragglers. Since he was barefoot, his steps were soundless, but that wasn't why those creatures took no notice of him. He could have been stomping with hobnailed boots and shouting at the top of his lungs without attracting their attention. By that time, the procession had broken up and the spooks were scattered over a large muddy field interspersed with grey grass. Some swayed from side to side, others stood or sat motionless. But in all their eyes there was a feverish glow and they were all looking in the same direction. Then, Atreyu saw what they were staring at in fascinated horror. On the far side of the field lay the nothing. It was the self-same nothing that he had seen from the bark troll's treetop, or on the plain where the magic gates of the southern oracle had stood, or looking down from Falcor's back. But up until then he had always seen it from a distance. This time it was close by. It cut across the entire landscape and was coming slowly, but irresistibly, closer. Atreyu saw that the spooks in the field ahead of him were twitching and quivering. Their limbs were convulsed and their mouths were wide open as though they had wanted to scream or laugh, though not a sound came out of them. And then, all at once, like leaves driven by a gust of wind, they rushed toward the nothing. They leapt, they rolled, they flung themselves into it. The last of the ghostly crowd had just vanished when Atreyu felt to his horror that his own body was beginning to take short, convulsive steps in the direction of the nothing. He felt drawn to it by an unreasoning desire and braced his will against it. He commanded himself to stand still. Slowly, very slowly, he managed to turn around and step by step, as though bucking a powerful current to struggle forward. The force of attraction weakened and he ran, ran with all his might over the bumpy paving stones. He slipped, fell, picked himself up and ran on. He had no time to wonder where this foggy road would lead him. He followed the senseless twists and turns of the road until high pitch black ramparts appeared in the fog ahead of him. Behind them, several crooked towers jutted into the grey sky. The heavy wooden wings of the town gate were rotting away and hung loose on rusty hinges. Atreyu went in. It was growing colder and colder in the attic. Bastion's teeth were chattering. What if he should get sick? What would become of him then? He might come down with pneumonia like Willie, a boy in his class. Then he would die all alone in this attic. There'd be no one to help him. He'd have been very glad just then to have his father come and save him. But go home? No, he couldn't. He'd rather die. He took the rest of the army blankets and wrapped them around him. After a while, 
he felt warmer 